it is really such a pleasure to be with you here tonight and to have this chance with all of you to applaud the great work that Fix Democracy First and the others you're celebrating are doing uh, for our democracy and also to uh, toast the, the successes that you're having. This work is both urgent and vital, as I think my remarks uh, will convey. Um, I want to start with a prediction that may surprise you, especially uh, right now, this week. Uh, and that is that when future historians look back on our moment 30 to 40 years from now and try to make sense of it, I don't think they'll be focusing on Donald Trump. As outrageous as his conduct has been, as much as it absorbs all our attention, as dire as uh, uh, the, the situation in which uh, it's put us, I actually think that those future historians will be more interested in a quiet transformation underway that the current president's conduct distracts our attention from. I actually think of him as the distractor in chief now. Uh, and that is an ingenious slow takeover by the Koch-led radical right of core branches of our government, starting at the state level in 2010, think Scott Walker in Wisconsin uh, as the opening gun, and moving on to the federal courts, Congress, and the executive branch, with assistance from an infrastructure of hundreds of organizations funded by these billionaire and multimillionaire donors who seek to remake our country to their liking by stealth, as I will explain. This anti-democratic infrastructure now includes dozens of ostensibly separate national bodies, such as the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, the Federalist Society. It also includes 150 state-level organizations whose work is aligned through the state policy network, uh, including some here in, in Washington State. The, what, what is it called? The Freedom... Um... Yes, I usually look these up and I realize I, I forgot to do that. But yes, that's one of them. And I think there are actually a few more affiliates. Uh, it also includes organizing enterprises such as Americans for Prosperity, Concerned Veterans for America, the Libre Initiative and Generation Opportunity, and it includes colleges and uh, uh, centers at colleges and universities around the country, with George Mason University, which I wrote about as the flagship, but faculty at over 300 American colleges and universities now getting funding from the Charles Koch Foundation alone. <clears throat> and as those future historians who look back on our era tell the incredibly inspiring story of the 11th hour organizing that stymied this billionaire's bid for control, because we're not going to let this thing happen, right? Nobody in this room is going to let this thing happen. As they tell the story of the organizing that came together to stop this, they will, uh, I must admit, have to credit the genius of the Koch long game. They will trace how Koch's quiet focus on trying to destroy the power of the strongest barriers to success in this project, education unions top among them, uh, while radically altering the rules of the political process, together enabled the progression of this state uh, stealth takeover to the point we see today, which no one on our side would have imagined possible in 2008. And I think it's really important to go back and remember how you felt after the election and the inauguration of President Obama, because that is the measure of the success of this network, the fights that we're engaged in now that we never anticipated. So my research exposes how this happened and why, and it also explains what the ultimate end game of this Koch network is and what it will mean for the vast majority, who will be devastated if this Koch project succeeds. Uh, this network aims to, uh, uh, of course, destroy labor unions and privatize our public schools uh, and stop action on climate change and much more. Uh, but you will see, I think, that its ultimate agenda is much more radical uh, than that, uh, and you'll see that as I go along. So I won't summarize the narrative that anchors uh, my book's arguments here, but I will tell you this, that the story starts in 1956 when the state of Virginia 
was leading the wider white South in what they called massive resistance to Brown versus Board of Education, the uh, Supreme Court deci uh, decision that mandated the desegregation of public education. This program of massive resistance provided tax-funded vouchers for segregated private schools beyond the reach of the courts. It required the closure of schools that planned to desegregate, and it took away the First Amendment rights of the NAACP. It forever undermined public education in the South. Uh, and the school closures in Prince Edward County, Virginia, were one aspect of that. And that's actually how I picked up this story, where they closed schools for five years and left black children with no formal education whatsoever, while white students went off to private segregation academies with tax-funded vouchers. So we tend to remember that fight, that era of massive resistance, as the last gasp of Jim Crow. But it turns out that it was also the first big opportunity for the cause of free market fundamentalism, what some people call neoliberalism, to gain a mass audience among those recalcitrant whites of the South. And the founders of the free market fundamentalist cause took advantage of this opportunity. They flocked to the state of Virginia's side in the contest, thrilled at the possibility of getting tax subsidies for private schools. Of that crucible of my story, I will only say one more thing now, and that is that the author, Maya Angelou, was right when she said, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Because it turns out that what we're seeing today, now, in Donald Trump's America, is not the first time the libertarian right has leveraged white supremacy to advance an otherwise unpopular agenda. What I want to convey to you tonight, though, is uh, not that foundational moment, but rather what I see as the value added of my research for people like you who are dealing daily with the impact of the strategy that I stumbled on by chance while researching that uh, uh, Virginia story. Uh, and I will state my case plainly. It is that the right has been winning over the last decade, like never before, and with continuing velocity because, because the Koch network has effectively weaponized the ideas of a figure who is little known to most people, but who supplied the crucial ideas that are in play on the political right now, much as Milton Friedman's ideas were in play in an earlier era. Uh, this figure's name was James McGill Buchanan, if you've never heard of him, don't feel bad. I hadn't either when I started this. But he was the first US Southerner to win the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences uh, in 1986 for work that he started during that Southern schools crisis. He called his approach public choice economics, and he billed it as presenting uh, an economic analysis of politics. But as I found in the archives, its real mission was political from the outset. Its aim was to discredit government action, to convince us of the idea that government would always fail so that there would be no trusted alternative to rule by the market and so that they could help to protect the interests of the so-called makers from the so-called takers. Today's right, I learned, is using a playbook derived from Buchanan's ideas to undermine the collective power on which good public policy depends, and then to rig the rules in their own favor at every step. As Charles Koch put it in a donor summit last year, he said, very pridefully, we have made more progress together over the last five years than I was able to make in the previous 50. So he's been at this a very long time and feels like it's going quite well now. By following these ideas from their origins in civil rights era of Virginia to the present, I think we gain at least three important resources. First of all, we gain a deep understanding of the Koch Network's operational strategy, including how it might be blunted. And here I can refer you to this. I had no role in setting this up, but you can see here, with, with knowledge, we can rule the galaxy. Um, Okay, so that's the first one. 
The second one is that we gain a history that exposes why this radical right adopted a stealth strategy, and this is crucial. It is the really encouraging thing if, if, in a funny way, but that was precisely because its architects, Buchanan, Koch, and others, knew that the vast majority would stop their plan if they became aware of where all this was heading, because the vast majority does not want the society they will try to bring into being. And third, we gain knowledge of what it is that they are trying to do, what the ultimate Coke endgame is. And that endgame, which they wisely don't announce to the rest of us, is an incredibly radical transformation of our governing institutions, our legal system, and even our social and ethical norms. Its purpose is to, in time, force to impose total personal responsibility on the people. It would do this by undercutting our capacity to do the kinds of things that citizens have looked to government for help with for generations now, from providing for public uh, education and public health, to retirement security, workers' rights, anti-discrimination law, environmental protection, and more. This will give you some sense of the agenda these folks are collectively pursuing. The Koch Donor Network, in short, as my uh, book title uh, suggests, from using Buchanan's, uh, some of his own words, seeks to enchain democracy. The plan is, over time, to bind our political institutions in such a way as to make government unable to comply with the will of the people, at least where the will of the people involves tax transfers and government regulation, which is basically most of what uh, we look to government to do. So what we are seeing, and I think this is crucial to understand, is far more than partisan. This is not about D's versus R's. This is not even about liberals and conservatives in the old way. This is something new and different. It is a messianic plan, decades in the making, to fundamentally change the relationship between the people and our government, and to do so permanently in a manner that aims to pin the proverbial pendulum to the right so that it cannot swing back again. To grasp why having this plan of action matters, let me quote the head of Coke Industries' government and public affairs operation, a man named Mark Holden, gloating to a donor summit in late 2015. Uh, he said, we are close to winning. They don't have the real path. They don't have the real path. He was referring to journalistic critics uh, and advocate critics of the Koch network, but he might as well have been speaking of the rest of us because we didn't have the real path either. I believe I found that real path through my research by serendipity. That's a whole other story. But it starts with gaining control over an ever-growing number of states, now 30. It then moves through those state legislatures to choke uh, uh, to, to al rather to alter the rules of the political process in each one in a way that can ultimately choke progressive national policy too. Uh, and among the pivotal changes are these, and I can tell you this as a resident of North Carolina where I saw this unfold right in front of my eyes and I had also gone to graduate school at the University of Wisconsin uh, that was being transformed by Scott Walker in the same way at the same time. So among the changes are these. The most sophisticated and radical gerrymandering we've ever seen in the history, in our political history, in order to misrepresent the will of the electorate. Hamstringing labor unions, especially teachers' unions, which are the largest and most progressive in today's America. Undermining other strong liberal lobbies, such as Planned Parenthood. And then with these core defenders of democracy weakened, the strategy moves on to the next phase with voter suppression, privatization of public resources to alter power relations, preemption by state legislatures of local progressive wins. I uh, understand that you face some of this here in, in Washington too. Uh, attempts to undermine the independence of the state judiciary and more. And I can tell you that some of the things you're fighting for, we had won in North Carolina until these folks came into power and took them away. So what is this real path driving toward? The ultimate radical rules change, altering the US Constitution at the first and only state-convened constitutional convention in our history since 1787. The goal is to amend the Constitution in a manner that would curtail uh, 
most of what progressive social movements have achieved, not just since the 1930s, not just since the 1930s, uh, uh, 60s or the 1930s, but going all the way back to the 1910s. Uh, this will sound impossible, I am sure, but while we have all been distracted by the president and tweet, his tweet, daily tweet storms and, and all the other uh, outrages coming from uh, the White House, uh, the COPE network, working through ALEC and allied state officials in uh, the states they now control, have been quietly lining up authorizations for this convention. And in fact, Wisconsin's outgoing Scott Walker who lost a job in 2018, thanks to the voters, <laughs> had to find new work, and so he was recently named honorary chairman of one of the organizations pushing for such a constitutional convention. And consider this, again, while we have all been fixated on this president, uh, that I now think of as the distractor in chief, they have been lining up these authorizations steadily one after another. They now have the backing of 28 of the 34 states needed for the first ever constitutional convention in our history. Some background on this, Article 5 of the US Constitution provides two routes to amendment. One, through the process that you're proposing and with others, uh, rightly, for a constitutional amendment against Citizens United, the old style where you have lots of public deliberation and it gets aired well um, and, and goes through and uh, if it's supported, becomes part of the Constitution. The other, route in Article 5 is so radical it has never been tried because any such convention would be, by definition, a runaway convention, but it's happening. So what kind of a country would the libertarian dream uh, constitution create? James Buchanan laid it out. It would look a lot like America in 1900, a place where workers had no legal right to organize for collective voice, a place where corporations were free of democratic accountability, whether for consumer uh, protection, discrimination, or pollution. A place where the Supreme Court thought that mass voter suppression was just fine. Needless to say, a place with no Social Security or Medicaid or Medicare, and more. This vision is so reactionary that uh, Karen Flynn of Common Cause has rightly warned that they seek to roll back the 20th century. But here we hit another puzzle, which is that not even the voters who have been so unflaggingly loyal to the current president would want to live in such a country without Medicare, without Social Security, without clean air and water. No. So how exactly could the Koch-led right believe it could carry out such a transformation in a democracy as flawed as ours is uh, in some ways. And this is where my research brings something uh, new to the table and something unique. Because I found through this research that the operational strategy that Charles Koch and his field generals have come up with to surmount this rather considerable obstacle depends on stealth. It proceeds through a series of what Koch himself has called interrelated plays, integrated uh, incremental changes that build on one another in a cumulative manner, so that this cause never has to inform the people of what the true end game is, or even be honest without, with us about the purpose of each play that moves the overall project closer to its def, uh, uh, destination. Koch himself puts his method this way, he says, I often think of what we do as stone masonry. Once a stone has been carefully selected and set, it shapes a new space in which the mason can set yet another well-chosen stone. Each stone is different, but they all fit together to create a framework that is mutually reinforcing. Think back to Scott Walker's Act 10 that took away collective bargaining rights for public sector workers that he never campaigned on, but said this is our moment to draw, change history to his team. That was the perfect first stone dishonestly packaged as a budget repair bill. Other aspects of the misinformation, the stealth on which this project relies, climate science denial. The Koch network is one of the top promoters of climate science denial besides the fossil fuel companies themselves in the world. The myth of mass voter fraud, which strategically leverages racism in order to convince white people essentially that there's a problem and that's why you must have this legislation to restrict access to voting. Why stealth? I think this is the single most important part uh, finding of my research, that these 
folks know from repeated historical experience that the majority would never knowingly support their true vision and that elected officials who are accountable to the people will not carry it out. To understand how radical they are, you need to know that Ronald Reagan was a terrible disappointment to them from his first year in office because he did not walk the plank to the degree that they wanted to in his first budget. Instead, he ran up the deficit because he didn't want to be unpopular. Goes on, George W. Bush, same thing, gave seniors a prescription drug benefit. No elected official who is accountable to the people will carry out this agenda. That's why they have to radically change the rules. As Charles Koch said uh, when he launched this effort in earnest, since we are greatly outnumbered, the failure to use our superior technology ensures failure. By technology, he was referring to the ideas that he found in the school of thought developed by James Buchanan, a way of thinking that has since become widespread on the political right, even as it's barely known outside the right. One of Buchanan's greatest gifts to the right was this advice, which he delivered over and over again. He said, if you don't like the outcome of the political process over a long period of time, Stop focusing on who rules and start concentrating on the rules and how to change them to get what you want. Because the fact is, the radical corporate right, we may forget it now, but they were losing the battle badly in the 1990s. The Cold War had ended between the US and the USSR. Even George Herbert Walker Bush was talking about the peace dividend and how that might be applied to all these bottled up domestic purposes. Global warming was coming into discussion with a sense that we needed to act on this great threat to us, uh, to, to our planet. New voters were entering the process through the Motor Voter Registration Act and the organizing of groups like ACORN and so forth. And it was then, in 1997, that Charles Koch got serious and got determined. It was then that he gave his first $10 million to Buchanan's center at George Mason University, where he has since become the top donor and weaponized whole parts of the university to advance this agenda. He made it clear with his first gift just how ambitious his vision was. Koch said, I want to unleash the kind of force that propelled Columbus to his discoveries. We have all felt that since, as the organizations and elected officials backed by the Koch network have engaged in systematic radical rules change that has brought us to the current crisis. We have felt that force in the transformation of the Republican Party, using the threat of primary challenges from the right and the lure of dark money cash as a reward for compliance in a kind of pincers play that has made Republican elected officials carry out the radical right donor uh, uh, agenda as opposed to even what Republican voters want, and they boost about this at Koch Network meetings. Uh, Mark Holden again says, calls the accountability play, this pincers action, our secret sauce, so to speak. We've seen that force uh, also in how the Koch network, having harnessed a major party to its purposes, then turned Buchanan's public choice thought into a step-by-step -step strategy to transform our country into a place none of us would recognize and very few of us would want to live. In Washington, we saw the force, uh, that force in the brinkmanship, the Republican Party, thus transformed, applied to make sure that citizens not be given any new reason to believe in government. Not the Affordable Care Act, not card check for labor unions, not immigration reform, not action on climate change, and not common sense uh, gun laws. And lo and behold, since the inauguration of Donald Trump, the Coke wish list is being granted with epic speed on almost every front. One administration official gloated just uh, two weeks ago at a meeting with oil and gas corporations, and I quote, one of the things I have found absolutely thrilling in working for this administration is the president has a knack for keeping the attention of the media and the public focused elsewhere while we do all the work that needs to be done. So, what does all of this mean for people like those in this room who are deeply committed to democracy reform, who are deeply committed to having a responsive, uh, transparent government that can carry out the will of the people? 
If we have this Coke battle plan, if we know where it's coming from, if we understand how radical and dangerous that real end game is, what are the implications for what we do? I'll highlight just a few in closing because again, we're not gonna let them win, right? <laughs> I have seen this all over the country over the last two years. People are getting this. People are really getting this, and, and it is exciting to be part of the process of witnessing this. But so let, let me highlight a few uh, things. Well, first of all, I would also say the 2018 midterms, <laughs> what a promissory note on what can be done when people start to get it and start to organize. And in terms of, of tonight's agenda, and this has already been mentioned, but everywhere that democracy reform was on the ballot in 2018, Everywhere it won. People are hungry for this kind of democracy reform. And that's important because I think one lesson we can take from this Koch Network project and the impact that it's had is that just taking stands on single issues even critical issues like job creation and health care uh, or climate action will no longer work as it once did because our political system has been so upended and deformed and distorted by this corporate radical right. That means that democracy reform must become a key focus of every progressive organization's work, as must alerting the public to the profound danger our democracy is in, and not just from Donald Trump. As a nurse reader of the book, uh, 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 put it in, a, in a, a letter to me, she said, I realize now that this president is the tumor, not the cancer. Yeah. The cancer that enabled this acute crisis and that helped someone so unfit and so dangerous get into the highest office in this land, the cancer is the chronic problems that have allowed the Koch strategy to get as far as it has. The escalating inequality in our society, which is more egregious than in any other society in the world, to the point where most Americans don't even understand how profound the inequality is, that has put made it so that Charles and David Koch, if they were one person, they would be the richest person in the world who is doing this. So the inequality, the dark money in politics that comes from those huge levels of inequality, from people who don't even understand how the rest of the citizenry lives. Obstacles to voter participation, which are much more egregious in our country than in others, in most other democracies. We should be ashamed of how hard we make it for people to participate. The gerrymandering that lets elected officials choose their voters rather than voters choosing their elected officials. The radical changes in legal rules and Supreme Court rulings and more. Um, to say nothing of the Electoral College. <laughs> so as a historian who has studied the Koch plan and a specialist in the history of social movements who's thought long and hard about all this, I have to tell you that I truly believe that the only way to get out of this acute crisis and to make sure we never face anything like this again is deep structural reform of the rules of government. Here in this room, you know the kinds of measures we need. We need uh, reform to stop the flow of corporate money to political candidates, <laughs> dirty money in many cases. We need to make it much easier for people to vote as the Cook County Board of Elections is and things like automatic voter registration could do. We need to systematically rebuild countervailing power to the extreme wealth like the Koch donor network. Union power, community power, the power of organized citizens coming together for shared purposes. As some activists are putting it, and I really love this phrase, and I think the people who were awarded uh, tonight, their organizations are practicing this, we need to work on democracy beyond elections. On year-round enhanced organization and representation of the people. And we have to unrig the law and the courts that have been so systematically distorted by infusions of money from the political radical right since the 1970s. Charles Koch boasts that he provided the seed money for the Federalist Society. He's a continuing donor. If you want to look at our Supreme Court majority now, that is the measure of the impact of this money in politics. 
and it is to the right of 90, the Roberts Court, Roberts rulings are to the right of 90% of the citizen rate, including most Republicans at this point. So here though is the kind of fun irony that history is full of. And I have to tell you, I love my area of work because I think it's also, at least studying social movements, it's kind of an antidepressant at difficult times <laughs> because you can look back to other times, like if we think we have a steep climb, go study the abolitionists for a day or two and read about what they were facing, right? We have so many resources behind us, so much talent, so much potential, and we have an interesting ironic situation in that in trying to take away our shared, shared toolkit of a responsible, accountable, uh, transform, uh, transparent democracy that could do the people's work, the Koch network may have done for us what we have been so unable to do for ourselves for so long. That is to help us realize how much we all have in common the vast majority, how much we need one another too to preserve our shared values, our past victories, uh, and to save our common planet. So I will actually, even though I know my story is bracing and chilling, but remember, Knowledge is power. Um, uh, I will end with hope because there is so much to justify this hope. All around the country, people are realizing that this is an all hands on deck moment for the uh, defense of democracy in this country. We are seeing this across sectors, from labor union members to environmentalists, from civil rights activists to good government groups, from feminists to retirees who don't want to see the world ruined for their grandchildren. You can see it in the teachers' mobilizations that have swept the country in states like my own North Carolina, West Virginia, Oklahoma, Arizona, et cetera. You see it in Black Lives Matter. You see it uh, in the Women's March. You see it in the growth of indivisible and resistance groups. You see it among the Parkland students in their March for Our Lives. And you see it in the outraged reactions to family separations at the border. You can see this reaction building, this demand building in uh, the uh, House Bill 1, uh, a promissory note on the kind of sweeping reforms we need to fix our democracy first, uh, to ensure voting rights, campaign finance reform, a crackdown on lobbying, et cetera. Uh, and you can see it in your own state from the work that you are all doing. I will say this in closing. This shared sense of urgency among all of the, the people who are getting active on these issues now, whether they've been in this work for decades, as some have, or whether they just, the day after election day <laughs> in 2016, started to look around and didn't like what they saw, wherever they're coming to this from, they are starting to realize that we cannot just keep doing the same things in the same way and expect better results. We have to step up our game. We too have to begin to think long term about the kind of society that we want to live in and how we're going to bring it into being. We too must build power at the state level, not just the local level and not just the national level. The state level is where the right got so much power to wreak this transformation. We too must work to change the national conversation about government. We too must pay attention to the judiciary and to setting it right. And to do all this well, we have to reach beyond our silos and make the kinds of alliances we need to reclaim the future and to walk together to do that. We must, in short, reform democracy to save it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be with you. Anybody's got a question? I have a question. Yes. Um, the Powell Memorandum. How does that connect to all of it? Yeah, so the Powell Memorandum, many people may have heard of, uh, came in 1971 from um, uh, 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 um, attorney Lewis Powell, who then shortly after that was named by Richard Nixon to the Supreme Court. 
uh, Powell was in many ways a product of the story I tell in Virginia. He was actually head of the Richmond School Board as these fights were going on, and it was his neighbor, um, who was also involved in these Virginia events, who asked him to write that memo for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And the memo basically urged corporations to mobilize as never before uh, in politics, uh, to change the courts, to change the universities, and, and public discussion and debate. So it was very important but it was also, I learned in my research, um, part of a number of initiatives that were happening at the same moment um, with the same kinds of objectives. So Buchanan was call, started calling for what he called changes so radical as to constitute a constitutional revolution. That was his phrase, constitutional revolution. And Charles Koch then began funding groups like the Institute for Justice, which has the very, very radical uh, quest for a pre-New Deal constitution that um, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas advocates. So all of these things were happening at once, but the idea behind them was, again, this focus on corporate mobilization to change the political direction of the country and also to transform our judiciary. So they've actually been, you know, very successful in that judicial transformation in particular. Yeah. Oops. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so I really appreciate you talking. I, uh, I know a little bit about the thing with the quote what I was trying to get the convention, but I didn't, know, I didn't know as much about it as thank you so much. So uh, if there's one action that we can take, uh, other than, of course, supporting the democracy, fix the democracy first, more yeah. like, what, what would be one thing that you could ask us to do to us? Uh, Thank you so much. I will say I don't think there's a single magic bullet to this. So I think the most important, I guess I'd say the most important thing is letting people know that this is happening because, you know, and I quote uh, Justice Brandeis in my conclusion, but sunlight is the best disinfectant, he said, right? And people do not know that this is happening and the Koch network does not want people to understand that this is happening. They want us to be distracted. They want us not to pay attention. So I would say that's the biggest thing. What's the best source on the one single source that would be the best? Oh, for the Constitutional Convention? For uh, Common Cause, fantastic information on the, co if you just Google, you know, Common Cause Constitutional Convention, um, you will see, they have a, a, a brochure you can print out and that you could use and you could bring to educate, you know, uh, the organizations you're part of. Um, I was going to say one other thing about that Constitutional Convention, what was that? Um, oh, and if you want to see, like, what they're doing, there's a group called Convention of States. You could see, they're, they're like, to see how far along uh, it is, you, you could look at that. And there are also 11 liberty amendments that they're pushing. And if you just Google liberty amendments, you'll get the listing and you'll see how radical they are. Yeah. Uh, I was going to mention that uh, the study I've done on the Constitutional Convention, and I fought for the Equal Rights Amendment a long time ago, and we didn't make it to the 75%. But I understand that the Constitutional Convention, if they were able to get to that, it could backfire on that. Yes, and Common Cause has actually said they've had success in speaking to many rank and file uh, conservatives, you know, ordinary people who are not deeply involved in this, because they realize, too, any, any judicial, uh, legal, constitutional expert who's not on the Koch payroll or part of this effort will tell you it would necessarily be a runaway convention, right? Because the Constitution provides no guardrails. It just says how you get there, and it says also that it has to be ratified by three-quarters of the states, but they could also change that, legal experts will say. So anything could come up here. You know, sort of the religious rights agenda could come up, but Common Cause has said, look, to, to the right-wing voters, the Second Amendment would come up. So, so anything could happen. And so I think, you know, um, once people begin to dig into this, they do begin to realize how radical this is and how dangerous. So I'm curious, um, I heard that David Koch is, uh, was one of the board members on uh, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we had an incredible shift here in our uh, public broadcasting station, uh, KCTS Channel 9. We had a number of local producers that did local stories. And then about eight years ago, they were all ousted. Wow. And now we have kind of a, a more national focus, not just in our KCTS, but also in uh, radio, KUOW. It's really, uh, really shifted away. Right before they started high intensity developing to displace poorer people. Imagine that.
Yeah, the media is a huge challenge in all this, right? And we know how significant the right-wing media universe is. Um, and it is also disturbing, as you're suggesting, to see the way the Koch network now is greenwashing, because they, know, they basically crashed one of our major political parties, right? And they can see that the Republican Party now is almost repellent to youth, including the majority of white youth. So they've got to scramble and figure out, you know, how to do things differently. And so one of the things they're doing is those gauzy ads that you'll see giving to public radio. They've worked on mass incarceration because they're especially con concerned to get white collar criminals get lesser penalties for nonviolent crime. I mean, it's really a mess. But I think what, what we can do um, is inform ourselves through organizations like this. And I think also, you know, with National Public Radio, as with other media sources, that's something else to do to challenge them. When they don't cover a story adequately or when they feature people as though they're neutral when they're not. For example, um, a, a, a case in point of, of what you're saying, I've heard the national, you know, uh, feed for public radio Radio, giving more and more airtime to this Koch-funded group called Concerned Veterans for America. These guys are out to privatize the VA. I mean, yeah, they're veterans, but they are doing an agenda that is at odds with every other major veterans group in this country who know that veterans have very complex health care needs, and there have been studies done to say they would be terribly served in a private system, even though, you know, there are clearly flaws with the, with the VA, um, you know, in, in its current state, but so all the real veterans groups, you could say, oppose this. Concerned Veterans for America pushes it, and yet NPR lets them get on without saying, you know, brought to you by the Coke Donor Network. So I think, you know, as citizens, the more we inform ourselves, the more we can challenge uh, these things and these distortions when we get them. Go ahead. I just, I just wanted to ask how we can stop funding Coke industries. Maybe as an American uh, public, we have to look at where the buck stops and stop supporting it. You know, that's interesting, but um, there's research on corporate boycotts. Very, it's the, the, the successes in corporate boycotts are the exception. Most of them do not really work. There's been some like the Nestle boycott, you know, a few other highly targeted things, the anti-apartheid divestment campaign, um, you know, have been effective. But I, I remember at the time when Scott Walker was doing all this stuff and people recognized the hand of Alec and the Koch brothers and they put out this list of Koch brothers products to start a boycott. But first of all, they are such a huge multinational conglomerate that it's almost impossible. You know, you can stop paper towels, but is that going to stop them? You know, they have so many other things and a lot of their products are producer goods too. So I, 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 you know, I, I appreciate the sentiment and I share it, but I think that we've, what we've got to do is this structural democracy reform to stop them from fixing the rules and then alert people to what this is really about. And for example, they always say we have to reform Social Security and reform Medicare. And our journalists don't understand enough to ask the next question and say, really? Do you support the principle of social insurance that Social Security was based on or Medicare? Because they don't. They want to destroy them. They want in time to get us to a system of individual private accounts for all of our needs, including retirement and um, and uh, health care, and that would be devastating to all of us, right, and to the whole system. So again, I think that's a case where knowing how to expose what they're really seeking, what hides behind the nice phrases, might be more important than not purchasing, you know, one or another of their products. Yeah. Uh, so, since history always repeats itself, what historic government um, format would you equate this to? Is it like a complete, absolute monarchy? What, what before time is this? A, you know, does this follow from? So that we can kind of yeah. put it in context and understand it. Yeah. Um, well, as a historian, I have to say, like, we don't really think things repeat themselves because the world is always changing, right? And the conditions change, so it won't ever be quite the same. I can tell you that there is nowhere in the social sciences a concept for what these people are doing because it's so radical and so different. I mean, it's not a, you know, a conspiracy. You think of a, you know, a couple of guys trying to steal cars or whatever, you know, but this is so much bigger than that. And they can hire the best legal talent to stay on the bright side of the law 
as they change the law. So it's, you know, just even the language that we have to apply to what they're doing doesn't work. It's that new and that radical. But I think, you know, what they are clearly trying to do is enshrine an oligarchy or a plutocracy, you know, choose, choose your phrase. But the legal system that they, they dream of and that they talk about restoring is something like, as I mentioned, that which existed in 1900 in this country, which, you know, any historian um, or, or public school history teacher will tell you that was the time of the, the most unique corporate dominance in our political history, right? When government was all but bought and sold by those that were called the robber barons and the Supreme Court would strike down reforms that came from any state or locality. It was, you know, it was a huge fight to overthrow that. So I think, um, you know, a kind of gilded age oligarchy, but with also, it's like you can't even go back to that because now we have the new things in play like the threat to the planet, right? And so climate change is already affecting people as we know and affecting communities and, and, and creating refugees and crises and drought. So many of the migrants that we're seeing now are climate migrants, right? Their, their conditions of life have been made impossible where they're coming from, so they're leaving and they're meeting this level of, of um, uh, nativism and hostility that's also being, you know, agitated by the right. So, you know, what's going to happen when climate, if we don't get ahead of climate change and those migrant flows really increase? Um, I, I don't want to end on a, a very somber note here, but I'm just saying we got to get ahead of this thing because some dimensions of what we're seeing now we've never seen before. Or, you know, like the Facebook, the social media world and all of that. It's a really different time. But again, I also, as a historian, believe that we have resources we have never had before on the progressive side, if we can only get it together and align our work and, and do work together. The numbers of mass organizations that exist, the, ta the diversity of leadership talent, the arts on our side. You know how, Don remember how like Clinton White House, Obama White House, I know we're nonpartisan here and stuff, but just for example, like the artists and the writers and the thinkers and the producers they used to have come. You know who Donald Trump has invited? Ted Nugent. <laughs> like. Really, we have a lot of resources on our side. And I think, and here's what I'll close with maybe, is because you had also asked me what can we do. This is a big problem, and it's operating along many domains. So we can all, in a way, we know we want to be part of something. We know we want to contribute. We know we want to help. But we can't possibly each do everything, right? So I think if each person in an audience as varied as this, and, and like many others that I've spoken to, if each of us sits down and thinks about who we are, who do we know? What next works are we part of? Are we part of an alumni group, a religious congregation, you know, some kind of clubs, other organizations, all the people that we can inform and engage and set in motion, and then also think about who we are. What's, what's, what, what, each one of us has talents, right? Things we're really good at, passions, things you care especially about. Think about committing you know, in the area where you feel like you can make the greatest contribution and then try as you make that contribution to connect it to all of these other domains so that we can all see that we're working as part of an integrated, you know, um, tapestry really of resistance. I think, I think that's what we need and I, I'm so grateful that you're a part of this and you give me energy, so thank you, I'm, I'm inspired. <laughs>
Well, it's time to burn down that pompous facade, that rotten racket, that house of fraud. Chains don't break because you ask them to. I'm making a fist, buddy, how about you? Because nice doesn't make any waves. Nice doesn't move any mountains. Nice doesn't make any noise. Let's make some noise. Hand me that wrench now, let's take turns And maybe we can open this can of worms Make some plans, draw some straws And if we have to, we can break some laws Because nice doesn't make any waves Nice doesn't move any mountains Nice doesn't make any noise Let's make some noise Now I can see the future looking back in disgust Their whole wide world is depending on us We can't let them down so let's get together and go downtown. Fighting fire with fire don't make any sense. You gotta use the water in the present tense. Not the nice kind of water where the rich folks swim, but the fiery kind that you drown in. The kind that raises like a great big wave and drowns the palace on the promenade that turns it all over like a tumbling dice. Now that kind of water isn't very nice, but nice doesn't make any waves. Nice doesn't move any mountains. Nice doesn't make any noise. Let's make some nice doesn't make any waves. Nice doesn't move any mountains. Nice, doesn't make any noise. Let's make some noise. Last summer, my car was stolen. Oh, I know, I know, but you know, it's better than being run over by a truck. That's how I look at it. And uh, it was gone for about a week, something like that, five days. Nothing was missing. Well, actually, the, my, my gig bag was missing, and it had some wires and stuff in it, but, you know, whatever. But, you know, it was fine, not a mark on it. They were able to get in with, I don't know, wishful thinking or something. They could get right in, you know, whatever. And, uh... Before it came back, I talked to all my friends that, you know, people told me stories... And two people had different versions of the same story, which was that their car was stolen and then was found with homeless people living in it. And I thought about that, you know? Now, it doesn't tell you that the homeless people stole the car. It doesn't tell you that. But it does tell you that somebody needs a place to live and they're living in your car. And it may, it, it's set up this kind of, my, I, I think like a pinball machine. <laughs> If that makes any sense. She lives in a stolen car. Maybe my stolen car And if it was I'd probably forgive her She comes from Iowa Or maybe Tennessee Wound up stranded don't you see Oh don't you see Stranded in a stranded town Money is as money does And that's the reason why The windows all get dirtier When somebody like her passes by It's a duality of opposites In this part of town Everything is shiny new 
or else it's broken down. Stranded in a stranded town. My hands are cleaner than the hands of some of theirs. Oh, but the dirt is in the system and it's everywhere. And there is no antiseptic that will do this kind of dirt. We're gonna have to amp yeah, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna hurt Stranded in a stranded town Storm clouds are coming, rain is pouring down Water seeks its own level And it's that level where we drown Stranded in a stranded town In between the mirrors of success and blind ambition Is there anybody accountable or is it just a random imposition? We bury them in landfills beyond the shadows of our doubt We honor them with candles and then we blow them out Stranded in a stranded town